Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib and it's time once again for your weekly wrap up and we're going to be talking again about Starlink today. If you missed my initial video, this is an internet service being delivered by satellite from SpaceX, Elon Musk's company. And we talked a lot about what this could mean for rural broadband and there's even more good news because they're not the only ones getting into this. There are at least two other competitors that I think have an impact here in this new industry. And we're going to talk about the impact of all these companies on astronomy and astrophotography as well. Lots to explore here, so let's get to it. Now, after my initial video on Starlink and its low Earth orbit internet service, I heard from a lot of you who are in rural locations, both here in the United States and in other parts of the world, where ISPs just haven't made the investment to bring higher speed cabling out to cities and towns and neighborhoods. I'm kind of in one of those areas where Comcast hasn't made a lot of investment in the broadband that we have here. And as a result, my upstream communications are severely limited versus other parts of my state. And it's really becoming an issue for me from a business perspective. And a lot of you out there have it much worse. Uh, some folks are stuck on really slow DSL connections. Others are using older satellite technology, and there's just not a lot of options out there, but there's a lot of demand for better service. Now, what's really been exciting about this is that there's actually more than one company looking at providing this kind of service to consumers and businesses. And what I thought I would do first is give you an update as to where Starlink is since our last video, which was just about two weeks ago. They launched another 60 satellites on February 17th, it looks like of the 302 that they've launched to date, 297 are operational. Their next launch is on March 4th, and service is going to be available in the northern U.S. and Canada a little later this year. I'm sure it's going to be very beta, but nonetheless, they are moving very quickly to getting a real consumer rollout of this product. And they have, again, a significant advantage here because they own the rockets and the satellites, and their rockets are reusable. And SpaceX gets a lot of experience in turning around those rockets quickly because of the Starlink uh, satellite launch schedule. So there's real benefits to their other satellite business here too because they're learning about how to very quickly turn things around. So there's a lot of up, upside on this for SpaceX for sure. And of course, a lot of up, uh, upside for consumers too. Uh, this is what it looks like when they launch the satellites. They stack them up on top of each other really flat. It's a super heavy payload, but they put them into a very low orbit. And then once the satellites check out, they boost themselves up higher. And this is where some of the issues with the uh, astronomy community come into play. And we'll talk about those in a few minutes. But let's take a look now at OneWeb, which is another competitor that is literally launching as we speak. Now, OneWeb is owned partially by Boeing, and they now have 40 satellites on orbit. 34 of them were launched on February 7th. So this is a very new uh, development here. Uh, they have an additional 34 slated for a March 18th launch and then another 36 going up in May. But one of the key differences here is that they are not looking to do a direct to consumer business. So this would not be something you subscribe to directly, but you might have a wireless ISP or a small local broadband provider who's using them as a backhaul. So rather than bringing fiber all the way over to a remote location, you'd set up a little ground station that would communicate with the OneWeb satellites and they would transit data back and forth to your neighborhood or your city or whatever. Uh, and we'll see how this business model works versus the Starlink one. Uh, so as a result, they're going to be launching less satellites, but they'll also, uh, again, be really positioning themselves as a backhaul for other telecommunications companies. And it's interesting to see this difference in business model. Uh, the Elon Musk model is to try to be direct to consumer as much as possible, which of course uh, they do with Tesla. And OneWeb here, who's owned by Boeing, is to go in a very different direction. Of note though, is that OneWeb doesn't own its rockets and all the rockets they're launching on are expendable. So I think their launch costs are significantly higher, but they are also launching less satellites as a whole. Uh, but they're also looking at uh, low latency. They're hoping to get around 32 milliseconds for uh, their latency back and forth to the satellite. They've done some testing here where they can get uh, over 400 megabits per second delivered to the downstream link station. Uh, they've been able to live stream video from video services at 1080p. Uh, so it probably will not rival your fiber connection, but they're looking at 
again, providing a level of service to areas that don't even have this at the moment. And I'm sure as more satellites come online, they'll have uh, the ability to do a little bit more. So the one web uh, strategy here is to get about 650 satellites in orbit. They will be a little bit higher than the Starlink ones at 750 miles or 1,200 kilometers but it won't be that big of a difference in light time between that higher altitude versus what Starlink has. Now the SpaceX strategy here with Starlink is to have thousands of satellites up there. Uh, they may only live for a year or two at a time, so they're going to be constantly replacing and launching new satellites. Uh, their altitude is lower at 340 miles, and they'll be serving consumers directly along with businesses as well. And that right now are the two that are actually in orbit around us at the moment but there might be others coming down the line shortly. And one of the others that I think has some viability is what Amazon is currently thinking about with their project Kuiper. We don't know much about it at the moment. They have applied though uh, to have 3,236 satellites in orbit for their broadband constellation. And the reason why I'm talking about them, even though they don't have anything in orbit yet, is because Jeff Bezos, who's the CEO of Amazon, is also the owner of Blue Origin, which has been making a lot of progress in their uh, race to develop a reusable orbital rocket. They have a suborbital rocket that's doing some amazing reusability and, and maneuvering. Uh, you can check out their YouTube channel to see all the work that they have done to date. Their new rocket is going to be called the New Glenn, and this will provide a level of service that will rival what SpaceX is offering, at least insofar as having a rocket that can put stuff into orbit and then come back down and be reused. And I think any company that wants to get into this business has to be able to get into space cheaply and frequently, and they are looking to do just that at Blue Origin. And when you hear all these stories about Jeff Bezos taking all this money out of his Amazon stock, a lot of that is going into this rocket company. Some of it's going to his new house, but a lot of it, if not all of it, uh, is going here because I think he sees that they're really making progress. They have a huge facility in Florida. We drove by it when we were down there covering the SpaceX Falcon Heavy launch. So they are very much gearing up to be a real competitor to SpaceX, both for launching stuff, but it looks like they've got the ability here uh, to offer a competitive service. And of course, with Amazon.com being one of the largest consumer uh, platforms in the world, they have a tremendous opportunity to sell that service. And it looks like they're going to be focusing on rural broadband. And I'm so happy to see that there is such a focus on this because there's a real demand here and our monopolistic ISPs have just left everyone behind and it's wrong. So it's good to see both uh, Musk and Bezos competing to provide service to many of you who just don't have anything adequate at the moment. Uh, they are actively hiring. There's 185 jobs open right now. Uh, so you can head over to their website if you have some aptitude in this area and see if there's something there for you. And I wouldn't be surprised once that new Glenn rocket gets going that we'll see a lot more development here. Now, like any new technology, there are always complexities involved and people that are impacted in ways that you may not have originally thought about. Uh, the astronomy community in particular is concerned, and I heard from more than a few people on my initial video about the impact to astronomical observations when you have all of these low Earth orbit satellites passing overhead pretty much constantly. And of course, the International Astronomical Union is very concerned about the proliferation of thousands of low Earth orbit satellites. And they have a great post on some of the issues of concern on their website, which you can see linked on screen here. Now, this photo on the front page of that article is what the sky looked like even before the Starlink satellites started going into orbit. And you can see just how much of their view is impacted by passing satellites and space junk uh, both in low Earth orbit as well as higher orbits. So it was a concern before, but they're very concerned now because as these Starlink constellations go up, initially there's 60 of these little satellites packed pretty close together in a very low orbit, and they're very, very bright. In fact, SpaceX has said the satellites ended up being brighter than they thought they would be. And this is not because they have lights on them. They're reflecting light from the sun, and depending on the time of day and where the astronomer is located, you might have things like you see here impact your observations because when astronomers are taking images of the sky, it's not like a simple click of the shutter. They're leaving their shutters open for an extended period of time to let in as much light as possible. And when you've got a train of satellites floating overhead, it's going to leave long streaks like you see here, which of course will dramatically 
impact their ability to observe the night sky. Now, what will happen is as these satellite trains get into their proper orbit, the brightness will become less of an issue, but there will be times of the day where even though you and I can't see these satellites overhead with our naked eye, uh, you will have these streaks being picked up on ground-based telescopes. And when you've got thousands of these things overhead, it will undoubtedly make an impact in their observations. Uh, the astronomy community, I think, realizes that they can't put this genie back in the bottle, that the need economically to get broadband internet to every corner of the world is going to be something you can't stop. So they're trying to work with SpaceX and the other manufacturers to try to make these satellites darker and less reflective. But I think the reality is that over time, the viability of ground-based telescopes is going to become more and more of an issue. But hopefully, the cost of getting things into orbit declining rapidly will mean we'll have more stuff on the moon and other things out in orbit that will provide unobstructed views of what they want to observe in enough quantity that the community can get the amount of research they are currently doing from ground-based telescopes done. But that's going to take a while. And don't forget, there's billions of dollars invested in current ground-based telescopes, a lot of those dollars, taxpayer dollars from around the world. And we do have to find some balance here to make all of this work for everybody. I don't think it's going to be as bad as this once these satellite constellations get up into orbit and a little bit further from the ground, but it's going to be an ongoing problem as we roll along here. Now, if you want to gain a real appreciation for why the astronomy community is so concerned, head over to heavens-above.com. You can put in your location and it will spit back a list of things that you can see with your unaided eye. And here's a bunch of stuff that it says I can observe from my backyard uh, tonight over a period of about an hour and a half. And as you can see here, we've got a lot of space junk, like these Cosmos rockets from the Soviet Union that were launched back in the uh, 80s that are still floating around up there. Space junk, in other words. But there's a lot of Starlink here as well. These were things that wouldn't have been on this list a year ago. And the brightness on these is enough that I can see it again with my unaided eye. Uh, with magnitude here, the lower the magnitude, the brighter it is. And these are not going to be things that are like as bright as the moon or as bright as the International Space Station as it passes overhead, but it's bright enough that you would be getting streaks on your long exposure photography coming off a camera or a telescope. And this is the kind of stuff that they're worried about. In fact, over that hour and a half looking up in my uh, backyard, 33% of the things I'll observe are Starlink. And again, these will change as those satellites get into orbit. But if they're launching so many of these things so frequently, it's not unlikely that a big chunk of the sky at any given point will have some kind of Starlink thing floating by. And then if we've got Project Kuiper up there and OneWeb and everyone else getting into the business, you can see why they want to have at least some discussion with the commercial satellite community about how we balance needs here, because this is certainly going to be something that will impact observations, uh, especially given how much I can see with my unaided eye just in my backyard. So I would love to know what you think about this entire situation here. Clearly, there's a balancing act we have to maintain between uh, this need to get broadband out further than where it is currently, but also the fact that the scientific community could be adversely affected by that development. Personally, I think getting more satellites off the ground is going to be the solution. And given that we have lower cost access to space now, probably the lowest cost access in history, I think there's a good opportunity for that. But in the short term here, probably over the next decade or so, it's going to be a very difficult situation. Let me know what you think down in the comments below. So let's move on now to some channel business. We have some new Patreon supporters to thank, Ramon De Vrede and John Kramer. And I also want to thank Mark's Custom Made Puzzles and McCurley, who joined via the YouTube membership program. I also want to thank some folks who gave me some super chats the other day during one of our live streams. They include Arsh Sazad and David Yablonski. I want to thank everyone who made contributions to the channel this week, along with everyone who's been making ongoing contributions. And I want to thank all of you who watch on a regular basis, too, because all of those things are important. We will be updating the credit rolls at the end of the video very shortly, so stay tuned for that. And again, thank you all for your support. And if you want to support the channel, you can go over to lon.tv support and make a monthly or a one-time contribution. We also, again, of course, support the YouTube membership program where you get some really cool loyalty badges that appear next to your comments and live chats. 
Now this week on the channel, we did a bunch of live streams. One of them didn't get into the archive, but the other two here did. Uh, so we unboxed and did some initial testing on a low cost Asus Chromebook, and we tested out that new Samsung portable SSD we reviewed on the main channel. Uh, that SSD got a lot of traffic this week because it was also unboxed on the Extras channel, which we shot during the live stream. And of course, we unboxed that uh, Chromebook, which we also did live on the live stream too. And then on the main channel, we had a really fun video I did with my friend Mark from Mark's Custom Puzzles, where we set up a multi-camera studio for him to do live streaming and recording, uh, which he can do very similar to what I do here in my studio, being able to live switch while you're doing the activity of shooting your video, which cuts down your editing time significantly. And we did it just by using uh, stuff that he had kicking around his house. It was a very fun project. You can see that link down below. We got the review of the Samsung Portable SSD. I really like this thing because it has a fingerprint reader on it that doesn't require software to unlock after you set it up. So you could take this to work, unlock it with just a finger touch and get all your data uh, available to you. And then when you unplug it, it's encrypted again. And if you lost the drive, nobody could access it. Really cool stuff. I really like what Samsung put together there. It works quite well. You can see that review link down below. And then we also took a look at a new Mevo camera. This is a self-contained live streaming camera with NDI capabilities for accessing it with OBS and other software that supports NDI. And what I like about the Mevo cameras is that they do this virtual zooming and cutting thing where you can make your live streams look more dynamic without having any operators or additional equipment. The camera can actually switch between people talking. It's really cool stuff. Check it out. In so this week on the channel, we've got a diverse range of stuff to look at. Uh, we're going to take a look at the Legends Ultimate Arcade Cabinet from AT Games. You may have seen this on a few other channels. Uh, what they wanted me to do was test it with the Mister. So we're going to have a twofer, a Mister video along with this cabinet, because there's now a way to access the controls via Bluetooth on external devices. So we'll look at how that works with the Mister in that video. Uh, we're also going to take a look at that Asus Chromebook, the C425. It seems to be performing quite well, and we'll have more on that in the full review. Uh, we also got in the Wise Lock, and this is a smart lock that works with an existing deadbolt lock you already have on your door. So you replace the interior portion with the Wise component, and it will turn your dumb lock into a smart one, but you don't have to change your keys out, so you could still use your key if you wanted to. And of course, we'll have our monthly sponsored video from Plex, and I haven't yet figured out what I want to do for that video yet. So if there's something on Plex that you'd like to see, let me know down below because that will really help me this month come up with a good topic to cover on my favorite media serving application. If you want to be notified every time I go live or do anything on the channel, you can click on that notification bell to be alerted of that. You can find me on all of these other channels, including the Extras channel for unboxings and supplementary content, along with the podcast, which is an audio version of this show. We have the snippets, the live streams, and my Amazon shop, where you can follow me on uh, the Amazon platform. You can engage with the channel with my email list. Uh, the Facebook group is always hopping. We're close to 900 members there, so you can sign up over there. And then we have my store where I sell previously used items that we reviewed here on the channel. And you can often get those items which were just gently used for less than what they would cost new. And if you want to be notified every time I add something to the store, you can sign up for an email list I have set up for that purpose right here on screen. And with that, we're going to wrap up this week's weekly wrap up. I want to thank you all for your continued viewership and support. Uh, it's been fun experimenting with different formats of this show, and it looks like uh, the single topic approach is working from a viewership standpoint. So we're going to keep tweaking this model a bit more. Let me know what you think down in the comments below. And until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters, the Four Guys with Quarters podcast, Tom Albrecht, Rajesh, Logic GR, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month.
Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.